Well, hello everybody. Welcome to my channel. My name's Louise Savage of Louise Savage Muses. Um, very pleased to meet you for the first time if you're joining me today and haven't done before and um, a lovely welcome back if you have. Um, well, it's nearly Christmas. Um, I decided to sit by the tree today um, and feel a bit festive. Um, and I've sort of been pondering where I want to sort of take um, this vlog next year. I've got a few ideas up my sleeve. But one of the things I'd really like to do is to celebrate some of my favourite authors, the authors that I keep going back to, not necessarily living, they might be um, long deceased, um, but particularly amongst the sort of community of authors who are still alive, the ones whose books I really look forward to. Those of you who um, have watched uh, my channel before will know that I treat books a bit like sweets or chocolates in that um, I quite often hive them away if it's an author I really, really love um, and save them to come back to at a, at a point in time when I really need to. And Kate Atkinson is, is definitely one of those authors. Absolutely adore her writing. And I was sitting down trying to sort of think why that was um, and also considering and celebrating all the pleasure that her writing's given me over the years. Um, and particularly at this time of year, because I don't know whether um, you've come across this, If I bet there are lots of Kate Atkinson fans out there, and I'm probably, you know, preaching to the converted in many ways, but I don't care. It's all about reading nostalgia. Um, so, um, this is a little short story collection. I can't remember when I acquired it. It's a few years ago now, I think. Um, and it's called Festive Spirits. And Kate Atkinson wrote three short stories um, to consider, I won't say celebrate, um, Christmas. And um, they are very, very typical of her writing in that they are full of very realistic characters doing really mundane things, um, but watched with this very, very wry, clever, intelligent, authorial eye. Um, so the first story I think is called Lucy's Party and Lucy um, is a mother who has several children, I think it's at least three and she's, <laughs> it's her perspective really on parenthood but more significantly on, or at least we, we come to understand her perspective through her attitude towards her children being in the nativity play and we watch that play warts and all um, so a really very um, realistic take, a very pragmatic take on parenthood, I think. There are two other stories in the collection. One is about a middle-aged couple um, who are sitting down to dinner um, at Christmas and they have a very sort of unhappy marriage and it focuses on their emotions. And um, the final story is about a, a, a chap called Gerald who is very, very a very touching story. He lives on his own with his dog um, and his mother goes off on a cruise for Christmas and Gerald um, is left on his own. He's only got his friend um, to turn to and it allows him to kind of reflect and appreciate um, his life. Um, so yeah, I really recommend this. It's a lovely thing to go back to at this time of year and, um, and it does sort of capture it uses Christmas as a catalyst, I suppose, to consider relationships and um, and family. So there we go, festive spirits. So that was kind of what got me thinking about this. Um, and I first came across Kate Atkinson. I realised it was 1995. I can't work out how, how many. It's not, not quite 20. Uh, it seems longer ago than that to me. Um, but this was her first novel, Behind the Scenes at the Museum. And I actually bought this as a present for my mum. Um, and she enjoyed it so much. She said, you've got to read this. <laughs> so I got my own copy. And um, it's one of the things I, I suppose um, that attracted me to it. And the reason I bought it my mum in the first place was because when I was 16, my mum and I had, um, and my sister had a little long weekend break in York uh, in the UK. And York is a, a really sort of chocolate boxy city. Um, it's, you know, it's got uh, the, the uh, black and white timbered old buildings and higgledy-piggledy streets. And it's just full of history. 
and and also my very first ever school trip i think i was five or possibly six um and we went to york we went to the um castle museum which features in the book because ruby lennox the protagonist if you like the focal character of the story um she visits the castle museum and sees you know houses that she recognizes because there's a there's a reconstructed um street in the museum um and what's wonderful about this book is that it's set in this kind of chocolate box um or at least a city that we associate with that but it's about ordinary working class people and um it tells the story of ruby lennox's life but also the lives of the generations of women around her um, and so because she I think Ruby's born in about 1910 um, and um, what Atkinson does so well in this book and it becomes a kind of theme that she plays with in all all her novels really um, is that she threads backwards and forwards over time and in this novel, we get Ruby's perspectives, we get first person narrative, but we also get other people's perspectives on her. And um, yeah, I just I just was really bowled over by her storytelling, by her, her prose is really clear and crisp. There isn't a wasted word, I don't think, in her writing. And her characters are so wonderfully wonderfully realistic so this was a really good sort of starting point and it, and you can see it was really I think it says on here the Whitbread book of the year it won all sorts of um acclaim as a as a debut novel um in I think 1995 doesn't say on the front um and then um we move on now I don't have I've read I think almost all of Kate Hack Atkinson's books but I realized a little while ago when I was perusing my shelves that a lot of them are missing and I suspect that's because I've raved about them and lent them to other people and you know often when you lend books you don't get them back which is fine it's all part of the joy part of the sharing so this is case histories and um this is the first of a series of five books I think it's five um featuring a uh, private investigator called Jackson Brody. so the genre on the surface of it is quite different from behind the scenes at the museum but um, I would say that all Atkinson's books have elements of thrillers about them. They are full of secrets, full of disappeared people, full of, um, yeah, there's always, there are always mysteries to untangle. And, um, and this is really, a really, I think, a clever, the more I sort of go back to it, the more I realise how clever this book is. Because when I first read it, I remember it feeling really disjointed and I was thinking what on earth is going on here because you've got three it's called case histories because Jackson Brody is um, investigating three cold cases um, it, it, he's in Cambridge uh, I think it might be Cambridge itself can't remember um, and there's the disappearance of a, a young girl from her backyard there's a, a daughter that's been murdered in her father's office and I'm trying to remember, the other ones are something to do with an axe murderer um, so there are these three cases which seem completely and utterly unconnected. Um, but as you read, the threads start to pull together and you realise that they are. And I've got, I've got to be really careful what I say because some of you may not have, have had the pleasure of reading these yet. Um, so I don't want to spoil it. Um, and um, and Jackson Brody himself, like a lot of really good literary detectives, is... Um, very flawed, he's not very good at relationships, he's um, got a wife and a daughter who he no longer lives with. Marley, his daughter's a, a fabulous character um, and his relationship with her I think is really interesting. Um, he was a soldier, he was a police officer, he's, his own um, background, his childhood was not remotely straightforward, you know, he's still troubled by his own past. Um, and yet and, and I say and yet and probably because of all those things he's incredibly there's a warm real warmth to him um he can be really empathetic and and as a result people kind of turn to him for help and support and that old the ex-squaddy and the ex-police officer in him of course um can't quite resist that so uh that I think Kate Atkinson just when she writes she taps into human character in the most fantastic way 
and you can kind of tell she's enjoying herself as well because there are certain lines that you just titter along to you just can't help it um and i i've loved that there are several others i've got some of them here but not all of them so i've got started early took my dog which i think is probably the fourth of the jackson brody series and i've also got what a wonderful cover this is big sky which i think is the last and final one whether she'll do any more i don't know um but um Jackson Brody kind of matures and his life changes and moves on. It's a bit like in, if you read Adrian Mole or you read Harry Potter and you kind of almost grow up with these characters. I think uh, Jackson Brody has, has kind of accompanied me through my sort of 30s, 40s, 50s now. Um, and, and I've really enjoyed that. And I enjoy the fact that she, I mean, he's originally from um, Yorkshire. Uh, Brody, but he's dislocated in Cambridge uh, very much at the beginning, you know, in the first novel. Um, by this novel, I think he's in Devon. I think he goes in Devon to research this one. And um, there's one that's set in the Edinburgh, uh, during the Edinburgh Festival uh, in Edinburgh. You know, we sort of travel um, to various different places as well. So the settings are interesting. But, but again, it's the characters, it's all the characters he encounters, it's the characters in his lives, it's his relationships that really, really bring these uh, fantastic novels to life. And then um, we had, now I've got A God in Ruins here, um, and this is um, a sort of uh, a companion novel to Life After Life, which came out before this one. Um, so Life After Life and, and has been recently very successfully um, serialised on, on, on the telly. Um, and um, Life After Life is uh, the story of Ursula Todd, who um, lives through the first half of the um, 20th century. And so she experiences the First and the Second World Wars. But what's really unique about this novel is that it's a bit like Groundhog Day, the film, if you know that. She um, is born and things happen to her and then darkness. And then her life starts over again and it's lived in a slightly different way, but there are things there that are very familiar as well. And then darkness. So we kind of get these sort of rebirths of Ursula all the way through the story and things are tweaked and changed and nudged. Um, so it's it's almost like a whole sort of string of what ifs, and it's yeah, you know, in many ways completely implausible. It is completely implausible when you when you you know think about it. But Kate Atkinson is so skillful with structure that she makes it completely and utterly plausible and unput downable. Because again, the characters in it are so real and so it's the it's the boring detail of life that she captures really realistically um, and I think what's wonderful about this one in particular is that it allows I, I think Ursula Todd is a kind of every woman um, because she is able to experience so many different things by the fact that she kind of the darkness falls and then she comes back and things are slightly different have changed in, in her life um, that it allows Atkinson to toy with uh, a lot of sort of, um, what's the word? Uh, oh, my brain. I, don't, I shouldn't be tired today. I'm on hot. It's the, it's the Christmas holidays. Can't even remember what I was saying now. Yeah, it, it allows um, Atkinson to, to toy with a lot of the sort of rites of passage of women. Um, a lot of the sort of uh, issues that that uh, women come across, negative and positive, m more negative than positive, um, in the in the twentieth century. So, um, yeah, I absolutely loved Life After Life. Now, God in Ruins is the story of Teddy Todd, who is Ursula's brother, and his. So we already know him if we've read Life After Life. We already know him as a character, and um, he was a pilot in the Second World War. Um, he's a prisoner of war for the last couple of years. He comes back um, once the war is over and really struggles with um, adapting to ordinary life, which, which let's face it, 
everybody did. We've just been through a pandemic. I know it wasn't a war, but that whole sort of adjustment after something like that has happened and the way the world is never quite the same. I think he refers to the war as a chasm um, and the idea that once you've kind of cross that chasm you can't go back you can't you can't reset yourself and behave as though none of those things have happened so although the world is returned to normal um it's not normal at all and um this novel also traces really well really successfully i think the impacts of war on the generations that come during and after so, you know, there are characters in this in this novel, for example, um, Teddy's daughter, who didn't, you know, didn't experience the war, but she is affected by it. She she's incredible character. She's really unlikable. <laughs> and her relationship with Teddy is very strained. And again, there are lots of secrets um, and that's one of them. And, and eventually we, we find out why. Um, but she's... Uh, She's a writer. Um, her observations on the world are, are quite interesting because she's always look, on the lookout for a story. Um, and as a as a wife and a and a daughter, she's just not very, um, just not very pleasant. Um, so you know the characters are realistic. Um, Atkinson explores in in um, her novels on happy marriages and and. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I, I think I'm repeating myself now. I'll shut up. Um, but hopefully, you know, this this is making some sort of sense. And I'm just loving talking about this wonderful writer. It's not until you sit and look at somebody's body of work they actually really realise how amazing they are. Um, I've just finished reading because I've been keeping it for the right moment. And um, this is what I wanted to read when I broke up um, for Christmas this year. Uh, transcription which um, is not her latest novel I'll come on to that in a minute um, but the latest one that I have read so this came out I think last year or maybe the year before um, and I've been hanging on to it and oh I just adored this so again it's the war and and you know it I love it because Atkinson's done so much research now I think she she must feel like she's she went through the war herself I think um, and and her knowledge means that when she writes about it, I think um, there is no forced historical detail. There's no forced context. I totally believed in Juliet, the um, protagonist. Um, she is a young woman who is groomed for um, working with MI5, or is she? Um, and um, and she ends up in a, a flat in Dolphin Square in London um, because she's got very good typing skills. And she is typing transcripts of conversations which have been recorded in the flat next door. Um, so she's kind of um, holed up there for months and months and months during the war, typing these transcripts, most of which are quite tedious and very difficult to um, understand because a lot of the uh, conversation is lost. There's a dog that barks a lot. There's you know all sorts of reasons they talk over each other. Why she really struggles to make sense of the conversation. Um, so that that whole thing I found fascinating. Um, but the the conversations are between fifth columnists. So it's it's uh, people living in in Britain who uh, British people who um, are sympathisers with Hitler. And um, her, what's he called? Oh my goodness, I only read it the other day. It does worry me. Toby somebody. Uh, but anyway, the, the guy um, the guy she's sort of working with, he um, he's in the flat posing as a fifth column, columnist. And the idea is that they, they're passing on all this information to him so that he can pass them on the information onto the Germans. But of course, it, it actually is going into the hands of the British, which is much safer. Um, so, yeah, so it's, a, it's a, a story of intrigue, I suppose. But it's much more about Juliet um, growing up and making sense of the world. She's a really unreliable narrator, which I really like because she's so naive. Um, and 
I think of all the novels so far, this is the one that's having, I mean, occasionally I was laughing out loud and like all our other novels, sometimes it's, you know, it's really serious, a lot of the subject matter, but there's just this gentle, very light touch. Um, and um, Julia ends up having to uh, create a an alter ego so that she can go and um, pose as a fifth columnist herself and how that all pans out. She ends up in some quite sort of uh, tricky situations. I just, I just loved it. It's just an absolute romp in a book. And finally, this beautiful, beautiful beast, Shrines of Gaiety. And I think this might, I think it's set, is it set in the 1920s or is it later? I know it's Soho anyway, and I know it's sort of all singing, all dancing. Um, I love the title, Shrines of Gaiety. It's just, I'm intrigued already. Um, so I can't wait to read this. Now, goodness only knows when that will happen because it'll be at a moment when I need to. Um, and um, that moment isn't going to be now because I'm just still mulling over transcription and that's still filtering into my brain. Um, but anyway, if you've never read a Kate Atkinson novel, I really, really, really recommend her. Uh, I think she's a genius. Um, she is one of my favourite authors of all time, for what that's worth. Um, and uh, yeah, she's given me hours and hours of joy. Um, so anyway, talking of joy, it is the season of joy. Have wonderful, wonderful Christmases, everybody. Um, I'm hoping to put another video out before the end of 2022. But my track record the last few weeks has been woeful. I'm afraid life has just been very, very busy in the loveliest of ways. Um, and I don't want to just make content for the sake of it. So there we go. Um, anyway, have a lovely, lovely, lovely year. Thanks so much for all your support. It's been an absolute delight doing this. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, just really, really um, can't quite believe that you've stuck with me. But there we are. Thank you. And, um, and all good wishes. Take care.